Uh, he subsequently uh, taught at Yale, becoming an associate professor, and then moved on to Northwestern, where he became a full professor uh, in 1969. Uh, Dr. Bott has uh, numerous awards to his credit. Uh, in fact, is uh, what was the uh, Walter Murphy professor in 1981 at Northwestern. Uh, has received uh, various awards, including the Colborne Holberg Award uh, in 1978. He is a member of uh, numerous editorial boards uh, in the scientific journals, including uh, the uh, Talisus Reviews, uh, Industrial and Engineering Chemistry Process Design and Development, and also on the journal of Catalysis. Uh, you all are aware of his publication and uh, patenting efforts, and uh, we're indeed happy that he was able to uh, come to our club to give the presentation tonight. And I believe that your presentation is entitled Catalyst Deactivation and Chemical Process Dynamics. Thank you, President. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very nice to uh, be here. Uh, somebody told me once upon a time that the uh, way that a good speaker starts off a uh, talk is with a joke, and since many of you guys have come here from a long way away, I guess I will start out with a joke. And the joke is about the fellow who went to go hunting in New Hampshire. And uh, he found this place to go hunting where the farmer rented out uh, his uh, farm to go hunting. And he, had, and he rented out the hunting truck. And he went out and so he had this grand hunting dog. And he went out and he had this uh, marvelous time. <clears throat> and he came back. And at the end of it, he said, boy, he said, that was the best time I've ever gone hunting in my whole life. He said, that dog just did everything, and uh, he flushed out the birds here and there, and the other thing. And the farmer said, ah, yeah, yeah. Well, the dog is so good. Actually, they call him assistant professor. <laughs> and so he said, well, I'm going to come back next year. Yeah, and so the guy came back next year. And same thing all over again. Went out with the dog, went hunting. The dog was marvelous. Everything, just anything you could imagine. And uh, he came back to the farmer and he said, you know, it was just even better than it was last year. He said, I couldn't imagine that it would be better last than last year, but it is. And the farmer said, well, ah, yeah, well, ah. actually, the dog is so good. To, you're right. We call him associate professor. <laughs> so the next year, the guy came back and he goes hunting. And he goes up, and the door to the farm house is closed and locked and barricaded. And he knocks on it. And nothing happens. And so he knocks on it some more. And so finally the farmer comes out and he says, Hey, he says, here I am. I'm ready to go out hunting again. I really want to do this. And I want to go out with that hunting dog. And the farmer says, well, sad story. And the guy says, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? Says, well, you, you know about that dog. No, I don't. Well, he says, you know, that dog got so good that we started to call him associate professor. And he was really doing very good. And he said, finally, he was doing so well, sad, we decided that we would call him professor. And you know what? Ever since we started to call him professor, all he's done is sit on his ass and bark. <laughs> 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 so that's my turn. <laughs> I'd like to uh, talk to you uh, a, good, a um, couple of things tonight that uh, um, have to do with the interaction of a catalyst deactivation and dynamics in chemical processes. And uh, many of us who are engineers, are, uh, even some of us who are chemists, are thinking 
without uh, diffusional problems or reactor problems, but we tend to think of them as being steady state problems. And I just want to give you a couple of uh, uh, examples tonight about how actually this question of the, the, the dog doesn't bark anymore changes the activity and changes all of our problems from what we like to think about being steady state problems into unsteady state problems. Now, this one right here is our patron saint, and that is Lucretia Borgia. And uh, all of you uh, will be entitled to receive a certificate as being members of the Lucretia Borgia Society after you leave here tonight. Lucretia is known only by the fact that um, she uh, uh, died when she was 37 or 38 years old, but only by uh, after having gotten rid of five husbands by the mechanism of poisoning. Okay? And poisoning is one of the things that we are interested in, and so we have the Prisha Borgia Society going to have the next slide. <laughs> And, and, and what I'd like to uh, sort of get into tonight, not we won't be able to go all the way, but uh, let's talk a little bit. Uh, what are some of the basic chemical and physical mechanisms of the activation? And uh, we can uh, divide these into uh, uh, three or four categories, where they talk about poisoning, about coke, uh, coking or aging, and uh, we'd be, uh, I think, uh, right now here, particularly interested in kinetics of uh, heterogeneous reactions subject to the activation. And then, what do we do if we have these deactivations and we try to go sort of up the scale from the mechanism of deactivation <coughs> to what happens in deactivation effects in intermediate systems, and, and by that I mean, you know, looking into an individual catalyst part. And Sam, let's go up one more scale. What if you go beyond the individual catalyst particle and you're trying to look into the chemical reactor problem? Okay. And I'm going to try to do this um, just by a combination of talking to you about some theory and some experiments. And uh, this is uh, really uh, in, in spite of uh, my um, uh, little joke about the dog. This is, really isn't a lecture, I hope. But uh, just to give you uh, some idea of uh, what's the background here. So. Now, <clears throat> what happens is that the way that chemical engineers have gone about this is that they say that we have a rate of a reaction. RT. And uh, that's equal to some function of con concentration and some function of temperature. And if you want to uh, let me put my hand over this, then R1 of C and R2 of T might be just a uh, regular uh, power law formulation or uh, Langmuir Henselwood formulation. And we'll come back to this in a minute. And then there's another factor over here, R, which I uh, write down here as R3 of S. That's a, an, uh, kind of an historical variable. And we're going to tie up all of the history of this catalyst into this, this thing, into R3. Uh, but of course, it's history, and therefore we have to write an equation it tells us how this S is changing, and maybe that activity is changing itself as a function of concentration and temperature, and itself as a function of activity. And uh, this kind of approach has uh, been given the name of separable rate uh, way to look at uh, deactivation and cluster. <coughs> Seppi, his student, uh, Professor Levenspiel, did this a long, long time ago, 1970. Now, <clears throat> I have here some stuff on uh, examples 
and uh, we may look at a couple of them, but uh, these are not going to be particularly important. I want to concentrate tonight, and as far as what we're talking about, is what does this R sub S mean in terms of the dynamics of the rate of the reaction in the catalyst? What is, what is the deactivation, whatever its mechanism might be, what is it doing to you? How does it change problems around? So we're used to thinking about as being steady state problems. How does it change them around into unsteady state problems? So, next one. Next one. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, you find out is that if you um, look uh, just at relative activity, versus the fractions of sites that are poisoned, whether this is by poisoning or doping or whatever. So there are a number of things that uh, can happen. One is that we could have a linear relationship between activity and poisoning, and so that would be called non-selective. Now, in most cases, and I'm supposing that uh, most of you <laughs> have run into this at one time or another, you don't run into that. You see something like this, where the uh, relative activity decreases uh, rather uh, abruptly with the fractional site poison. And uh, people in the literature, at least in the academic literature, like to call that selective poison. Now, these things have consequences that come from kinetics that are not immediately apparent. And we need to talk about this a little bit. Because if you're doing catalyst deactivation studies and you measure a relationship between the activity and the fraction of site poison that comes out much very very selected like that that does not necessarily mean that that is the interaction between the surface and the poison it may be the consequence of the interaction with the surface the poison and some diffusion Okay, so this is not necessarily just the uh, automatic measure of uh, activity. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about uh, this question of uh, <coughs> modeling and uh, dynamics. And uh, so we can start here and we can say, Various sorts of, well, I take my favorite academic reaction, okay? A goes to B. You know, no professor would ever be able to make a living if it wasn't A goes to B. <laughs> <laughs> so, the rate of A, we could model this as being a power law, PA, B, A, and then Or maybe we might try to be a little bit more sophisticated and try to measure this and, 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 and model it and you know, hyperbolic or a alignment. Now what I'm saying is that then in general, so uh, our rate of reaction R sub A is equal to some function of temperature and some function of partial pressure. And our deactivation form says that okay we just take that as it is and all we do is that we tack on this third one, R3 of S, which is our historical variable, but we have to write some equation for the change of the activity. And I guess probably what we ought to do is think about the R3 of S function as being a countless activity function. So we have to have some description as to how the catalyst activity changes with respect to time. And uh, most of us are chemical engineers. We're very fond of uh, scaled variables. So we can think of R3 of S is actually a kind of a scaled variable. So that's when S is equal to 1, catalyst has its initial activity. When S is equal to 0, catalyst is dead. And, but as we go between those limits 
and maybe it's a function of temperature, and maybe it is a function of the partial pressure of reactants, and maybe it is also a function of activity itself, where we have now our scale variable, say goes from S equal to 1 for the fresh catalyst to S equal to 0 for the activated catalyst. Now, okay, so this is sort of background layer. How, how do you look at the kinetics of reactions and how are we going to tack on to the kinetics of the reactions, the kinetics of the change of the catalyst activity? How, how have people done this and what's reasonable? And uh, I guess what I'm really saying to you is that this is sort of a reasonable way to do it. And then what we want to do is to look at what does this have to do with a lot of other uh, reaction engineering problems that we're interested in. So here's the kind of thing. Um, we got to worry a little bit, though, about where all these things come from. And so I uh, will divide these things into poisoning and to coking and to simpering as well as being major And I'm going to say poisoning is sort of a chemically well-defined uh, thing. So we have some major reaction. A goes to B. Okay, there's my good academic reaction number one. A plus site goes to B plus site. But now we got some poison here, L uh, plus site, and that takes sites out. And what you see is that this is a parallel mechanism, but it's often first order, if you believe the way I've written this here. So the log of the activity is linear with time. And, and it's a kind of a well-defined chemical situation. Okay? Now, <clears throat> and if you look at another major mechanism, which is co-formation in a hydrocarbon, I think that you'd have to say that in most cases this is chemically not so well defined. And people have used a lot of time on stream formulations. And we'll worry about that in a minute. But if we look at the way that we might write kinetic pathways um, just uh, corresponding to that, well, you can think of two ways that things go. One is A plus site goes to B plus site, but A, the reactant, the activities catalyst, or a plus site goes to B plus site, and B, the, 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 the product, the activates catalyst. Now, this is very, very important in what happens in dynamics, because we have parallel mechanism here, we have parallel mechanism here, but we have a series mechanism there. And it changes everything around if you start to look at this in detail. We'll get back to this. Let's go to the next one. Um, <clears throat> what people have done for coking, since it's uh, not so well chemically defined, is uh, more or less to uh, do it in, in two ways. And uh, that is to make a correlation of the concentration of coke on the catalyst. And this ordinarily, or in many cases, turns out just to be a, a power law function of the time. Big T here is not temperature, it's time on the stream. And then another correlation that relates the activity to the amount of coke on the catalyst. We put all this together, and uh, actually what comes out is that uh, for operational purposes, the activity of the catalyst is an exponential function of some uh, time on the uh, stream and some quantity alpha that is uh, being taken only as a propensity for the activation. So the larger is the value of alpha, the larger is the tendency of the same thing. Third mechanism is centering. And I guess I uh, <clears throat> run into uh, most questions about this. I, I think about centering as being the um, uh, agglomeration of metal particles on the surface. Other people 
who are not working with supporting metal catalysts, but who are working with oxidation catalysts, think about this as being a collapse of core structure. And either way, uh, I think that we make a distinction between poisoning and coking and sintering in that the sintering is thermally activated. It's really basically not a chemical. And the people who have worked on this in detail normally resort just to simple power law forms where they say, okay, the change in the activity with respect to time is proportional to some power law function of the activity, and the activity is taken to be proportional to the surface area, and so we're going to make some measure of the surface area as a function of time, and ends up basically with a second order or some kind of higher sort of hyperbolic law. Now, uh, the couple of examples that I'm going to give you uh, from now on really don't have anything to do with that. I apologize for that. So we'll look at coping and the some Well, uh, some of the first thing that uh, we have to work about is what happens if we think about a reaction that is occurring in a catalyst particle that is diffusion limited? Our Keeley modulus problem. So, what does catalyst deactivation do to Ernest Keeley and others? Now, our familiar problem, if we go back to our academic reaction, he goes to the just says, um, and, and, and I apologize for writing a lot of equations uh, up here, and I won't make too many, but I'll tell you what I mean. This says the fusion rate inside the catalyst particle is balanced by the reaction rate. And uh, the inevitable result of this is then that there is a concentration gradient of the reactant inside an individual catalyst particle where CH0 is the uh, concentration at the outside of the catalyst particle, CA is concentration inside C as well. Now, <clears throat> because this concentration falls off, then the catalyst is not working as well as it could if the concentration were at CA0. So we define an effectiveness factor, or a kind of penalty factor, if you want, which says it's the observed rate divided by the intrinsic rate, and this turns out to be then a function of a unique parameter, which we call the Keeley modulus. And the Keeley modulus, uh, I think the important thing here to see is that it is proportional to a dimension, the radius of the catalyst particle, characteristic length of the catalyst particle and proportional to the square root of the ratio of the rate constant and the sensitivity inside the particle. That's a familiar problem. I think most everybody is, is, knows a little bit about that. So that we can plot the log t the modulus where there's this uh, log effect and it's in there, something like that. Now, what happens? You know, okay. talking about dynamics. Yeah. The difference is the catalyst is the activity. Well, you're welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Did I do the wrong thing? No, no, no. Sure. <laughs> Just one word ahead. What happens if the catalyst is deactivating is that we write and mathematically, exactly the same balance. But I call this the unfamiliar problem. So A plus psi goes to the product plus the psi, but in this particular case, let's say we have a parallel deactivation, and so A is responsible for deactivation as well. Now our mass balance and all of the mathematical details and, and everything we have to go through is exactly the same, except for the fact that we will tack on our little activity variable S here. Now, S, of 
computer's there, and we must account for what happens to S, and so we have to write another read equation that says that this is what happens to R sub S. And in this particular case, the rate of change of the activity is always uh, proportional to the uh, concentration of A and to the activity of the catalyst. So we actually then change our steady state problem into an unsteady state problem.
when I give up initial activity, I found this reaction, but I cut that one down too. So let's take it down here. So I squeeze down a pore structure, really squeeze out A from the pore structure, and give off a lot of initial activity. But you see the catalyst is deactivating much, 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 much more slow. And that is just a consequence of this parallel sort of uh, reaction mechanism. And it is a consequence of the dynamics of the parallel reaction mechanism. And I submit to you that it is something you would never think about unless you were thinking about the dynamics of the deactivation. You would never do that. Now, <laughs> we can be too clever. You know me in that next slide. If we, <laughs> if we go the other way, you can kill yourself. You get fired. <laughs> A goes to B, but now it's B that makes the code. Now, diffusion limited catalyst, okay, so we got concentration gradient of A, but now it's B that's making the code, but the concentration of B gradient is going in the opposite direction. And I ask you the same sort of uh, Socratic question now, where is the rate of deactivation the greatest? Where is the, rate, where is the concentration of B is the greatest? Where is the concentration of B the greatest? Well, that's unfortunately here in the center of the part. Now, this guy is going to deactivate from the inside to the outside. Exactly the opposite. The other. And so if you figured that uh, maybe you would uh, try to build a little bit of uh, diffusion limitation into this catalyst with this particular reaction system to get around the the activation problem, you would have exactly the wrong answer because everything you do here goes the wrong way. Every, every you know, it's time that you're trying to uh, constrict the core structure. All you do is to increase, uh, tend to increase the concentration B inside of the middle of the core structure, and there you uh, make it deactivate faster. So what was uh, really clever for the parallel reaction mechanism is a disaster for this series reaction. Okay, but it's very, very important, I think, uh, that uh, we need to think about uh, a little bit uh, <clears throat> when we get started in, in talking about uh, these uh, dynamics and deactivation to recognize exactly what is the nature, overall nature of the process that you're talking about, whether you can think about it as being parallel, or whether you can think about it as being series, or you know, as in most cases, it's probably some combination of series and parallel, but the strategies that are involved between the series and the parallel are exactly opposite. Exactly opposite. And, okay, these are little academic examples uh, of things, but uh, I find them useful. I, I, you know, I think that uh, you, you, you know, learn a little bit that. So, well, let's go one more. Uh, yeah. um, just to uh, convince you that these just aren't uh, coming out of an uh, academic brain, there are a couple of people that have worked on these uh, problems of uh, gradients inside of uh, catalyst particles, and uh, I, I ha I'm not going to say a word about gradient-less reactors tonight, but maybe a little bit about what I'd like to call specified gradient reactors. And these are reactors that are built uh, in exactly the opposite philosophy of making uh, gradient-less reactors. These are, these are little guys that are built to make sure that you have gradients, and you measure the gradients, and then you learn things from the gradients. And um, uh, I don't like to, uh, I'm not trying to advertise myself, 
but uh, just two people, uh, Professor Peterson in, in Berkeley and uh, myself. And uh, Peterson has a design that measures concentration gradients in single catalyst particles. And attempts to extend from measurement of the concentration gradients to know exactly exactly where we have you know, these parallel or series schemes. And so, uh, my uh, former student, Peter Keo, did the same thing to measure temperature radius inside a catalyst particle. And then see if we can, either Peterson's design or, or, or Peter Keo's design, see if we can use radius, measurement of radius to, to see what's going on. And uh, also, as I have here, a general background from uh, that uh, from Well, <clears throat> next one. This one gives you an idea of what uh, Peterson's design is. Now, this is a single pellet. Here's our pellet. So the stuff is coming in on the top here. It's really well mixed, and it goes out. Uh, but some of it reacts and some of it diffuses through into an area here. And so he can measure the concentration here and he can measure the concentration there. You see, Kyo design, I think, is on the next slide. Maybe a little bit better. And this is the same idea. Here we have influent coming in being very well mixed. This is a big catalyst particle and these little thermocouples that are across the radius of the product. And uh, I'll give you uh, just uh, the uh, results of one experiment where we try to measure them and see whether uh, what we expect from the idea of the parallel and series mechanism to work in this uh, radio temperature gradient experiment. So let's see, next one. Uh, go ahead. Uh, what was done was to uh, look at uh, just benzene hydrogenation in the well mixed environment. And uh, what you see here and I apologize for this. My son ran over this with his tricycle about 10 years ago, and I've never been able to focus it since. Uh, but this is overall activity of the catalyst particle, and it decreases with time. Okay? And what we want to do is to take a, uh, and this is uh, actually either at 110 degrees C or at uh, uh, 70 degrees C, and it's 1% thiophene and a nickel catalyst with a benzene hydrogenation. And so we're just looking at This is what you see overall. Now, what we want to do, so is to take a little snapshot of what happens with one of these big particles if we run it down to, let's say, this activity level, stop it, and then say, then we want to start the reaction again, and let's see what, where it's going to tell us where the gradients are. You know, are the gradients going to be where we seem they are? Okay. So we're going to stop this one at uh, about 16%. At 100 percent, at about 16 percent, and uh, or 20, or 40 percent, and 16 percent, and you can see what happens there. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what happens is that we stop this thing, and before we run any experiment, we just take the catalyst particle out, section it look at it, see what we can see. And this is sort of what you've seen. And now, and, and, and I'm trying to uh, then provide you with some experimental evidence for this parallel idea. Okay. This guy is deactivating from the outside to the inside. This 
is a nickel. Uh, it's a photograph of piece of catalyst. This is a an enhanced photograph. This has been subjected to the uh, reaction mixture with biofilm and then taken out and oxidized. And this outside layer right here it, uh, basically corresponds to the penetration of sulfur. It's the penetration of sulfur into the inside of the part. Ain't no sulfur ever seen the middle of that particle, ain't no sulfur ever seen the back part of the particle. Just right there. I mean, it's just going from the outside to the inside. Exactly. And that goes right along with what we were saying about uh, uh, parallel uh, mechanism of the activation. Um, next one. Uh, <clears throat> and, well, okay, academic, I've got to show you this. Okay, so there's the photograph. And this is uh, done from a uh, um, x-ray dispersive analyzer. Okay, and so we get a pretty good correspondence between uh, where we can see the interaction of the, or the difference between the deactivated exterior layer and the active interior layer both uh, between the scanning microscope and the uh, uh, photograph. So, you know, I don't think that that is uh, any uh, artifact at all. Now, how does this show up in terms of dynamics? Next one. Uh, next one. I promise you I wouldn't show you any more of this. A couple of things happen. Um, <clears throat> Let's start an experiment where we have this deactivated particle sitting then in this reactor at hydrogen at 100 degrees C, and suddenly we turn on benzene to the extent of 16 or 17 percent, and look at the ignition of the reaction. Now we can measure the temperature in the bulk, we can measure the temperature at the surface, we can measure the temperature in the interior, and we can see a couple of things that happen that are really very, very interesting. It ignites, okay, this is our zero man. Okay, then we turn on the benzene. Now, look, see how this outer layer is doing anything? You know, there's no exothermic. Benzene hydrogenation is exothermic to the extent of 52 kcal per mole. So here is our bulk. <laughs> And here is the surface, and this thing is beginning to ignite, but it ignites from the inside. And, furthermore, in the final steady state, when we get up here, we have an enormous temperature profile that nobody would ever predict. An enormous temperature difference between the surface of the catalyst, 120, 118 degrees up to about 138 degrees in the inside of the catalyst, and only about 110 to 118 on the outside of the catalyst. Now, every theory that you ever read will tell you that all of the thermal resistances are outside of the catalyst particle, not inside. But we essentially by deactivating this thing from the outside to the inside, build in an outside thermal boundary layer for all that. And that catalyst particle behaves completely differently from what you anybody would ever tell you. Just those completely beyond. One other thing, next slide, uh, is that we can go <coughs> and look at a couple of things very quickly. <laughs> Fixed fix, fix bed reactors act, act the same. And say deactivate from the front of the bed. And uh, my uh, only uh, uh, example here is uh, in the uh, next one. Round numbers are always false. Sure. Next one is that um, suppose we have a fixed bed reactor 
And again, we have a parallel mechanism of deactivation. But now it's a fixed bit. A goes to B, but A goes to Coke. And let's just concentrate on this. This is basically a plot then of A goes to B, but A goes to Coke. And here's the Coke concentration as function of reactive A. And I ask you the same uh, number of questions. Where does Coke down, uh, go down faster? It's going to go down faster where the concentration of A is the greatest. Where is the concentration of A the greatest? It's right here at the entrance of the head. So um, this is also a kind of a wave that goes through the bed, but it gives you a profile of Coke. Bed, because Coke is going to be highest at the end of the bed where B is going down. So we will have some increases. And that has some interesting results in the next one. Uh, if we try to then take this and analyze it in terms of how the reaction rate varies with position and time. So then for that parallel mechanism, I can say, well, we start off and the bed is not deactivated at all. So you see it sort of uh, some normal exponential fall of activity with respect to length. But time goes on for a little while. Now remember, we're deactivating Google. The entrance to the bed. Look, it's just like deactivating the outside of the catalyst particle to the inside. We're deactivating the entrance to the bed preferentially. So the rate falls off preferentially at the beginning of the bed. And then after a little while, then we have something like this as far as activity versus light. Now, pursue it dogmatically. Uh, <coughs> Then after a little while, the activity at the entrance of the bed is preferentially deactivated. And you can see here, uh, and this is a calculation that was done by Fromov and Duchal for isothermal conditions, and we're looking at isothermal wave activity. But nonetheless, it's, it's quite good. You can see that, that you develop a little bit of maximum. And what we develop here is a wave. Activity. So that then it's going to move through the bed, come out eventually after a while, and the control engineer's dream. So the beginning of the bed is not at all the same as the end of the bed. Okay, maximum activity at the entrance, minimum at the exit. Now minimum at the entrance and maximum. At the exit. So it's a moving target. But that's a dynamic that is dictated by the fact that we have this sort of <coughs> parallel kind of uh, 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 reaction mechanism uh, going on as far as the activation is concerned. It's completely dictated by the activation. It doesn't have anything to do with the main reaction dynamics or nothing else. It just has to be dictated by the activation. With this way. Um, <clears throat> next one. Just um, in, in one last uh, thing to follow up is that we follow <clears throat> this idea into non-isothermal reactors. And if we got activity waves that go through isothermal reactors, then we must have thermal waves or, or activity waves or something that goes through non-isothermal reactors. And that is for sure true. And we can think of two things. Um, we have uh, just a typical non-isothermal, non non-adiabatic reactor. And, and, and the idea here is that, OK, this first one here would be a typical traverse of temperature versus distance and give you a hot spot for steady state operation. 
Now, <clears throat> we start one of these deactivations, and what it's going to do is push that hot spot right down the bed. Plunk, 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 plunk. Well, we have an adiabatic reactor, so we have some initial time our uh, temperature went to traverse that looked like that. Same thing. It's just going to push it. And that really happens. It really happens. And I don't think that people recognize this so well, <clears throat> because sometimes these zones of reactions are, now, excuse me, are confined to rather small areas. And so you are actually, uh, actually pushing a rather small area of reaction uh, to, to bed. And so you sit at the exit. And you see this thing go fine, 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 plunk. That's because this temperature wave comes out of the end. So those dynamics are extremely important, and, and, and you know I really think they're extremely important. But they're dictated by the fact that. Um, well, I'll give you one more slide and then I will quit. I want to show you a uh, couple of <laughs> Beyond, 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 beyond. Beyond, beyond. Okay, this is an example. This is a little fixed bed reactor. And again, we have a friend, uh, Benzene, hydrogenation on uh, different chemicals. And uh, all we've done here is to Profiles. This thing is a little segmented bed, so this is a convert, this is a catalyst segment, this is a convert. And this is the first profile here that I show you is steady state. So we have uh, benzene, and hydrogen, nickel, moistening, a little bit of cyanine, like this first one. Would exist forever if we didn't poison it. And we put about 100 parts per million of cyanine. This is the reactor, and this is the way you can see the compression goes the temperature rate. So I'm not telling you things that are out of school. And here is one where we have done exactly the same thing. We simply have increased the space velocity along the initial reaction zone a little bit into the bed, turn side, and it goes away. So these things are very, very important. Here, we're pretty much dictated by this uh, question of uh, parallel arm, arm series methods. Now, what I haven't told you about tonight is that if I, all of my examples have been for the parallel. Everything goes from front to back. But if we turn it around and have a series, everything would go from back to front. Everything in the catalyst particle goes from the outside to the inside or from the inside to the outside, everything here goes in the front of the bag, but I can turn around and go from the back to the front. So these deactivation mechanisms are malicious uh, sort of things, and they, and they determine not only the, uh, you know, not only the dynamics, but they determine a lot about spatial or geometric sorts of things that we are not used to seeing.
Am I willing to give up a sufficient amount of activity initially to gain a sufficient amount of activity over the long run so that the area under the curve is ready to yield? Yeah, yeah. ready to yield. Yeah. You gain. Do it then. Well, post optimization problem. You know, it's, uh, you know, I'm not saying that it's sure that you do that, but it's not. But it, but it is a well posed problem. You do a lot of easier engineering problem. It's mm -hmm. one that doesn't have any null answer. Okay, so you say I don't know whether it's true, but maybe I can. I think that's what you're asking. Is that right? And, and that's my answer. Maybe I can. Maybe I can. Maybe I can. Maybe it's not worth mine. Actually, a couple of problems. But there's a, but there's but there's a but there's a way to go there and, and, and look at it. These days, it counts for data to be out of the accurate, but it is counts for data to be out of the capital chart. Depends on what the sales picture is. Well, it depends on the problem of control, too. If you, if you set your operation at a certain level of conversion, you can hold that. As you're going to say, we're changing the other way. It's going to be a very important aspect of it. We're still in state operation. But, you know, I, I, I guess I also emphasize that I'm talking about sort of extreme conditions. So that's one extreme condition, and there's another extreme condition. And, you know, probably you being in the real world, it's going to be somewhere in between. But it gives you some idea of that. What, is, you know, what are your options? And it doesn't guarantee you that you close down on the board structure and you're going to be able to do it. But it does say you need to have something to do with the score. If that particular mechanism is true. Whereas it does say to you that it's a serious mechanism of deactivation. It's ridiculous. policy the problem. And the last crack you heard, that was a nice and thermal reactor, wasn't it? Because if I read right, the temperature went up and then dropped again, whereas in actual operation, the temperature rise would carry that heat on through and raise the temperature in the bed after a while. Oh, that was the temperature in the bed. That was measuring the temperature down the middle of the bed. She said steady a, state. It's a steady state. The temperature of the gas would carry this is, temperature. this is steady state. That's an isothermal reactor, right? No, no, no. It's very, it's as non-isothermal as we can make it. But no, I mean the walls, say, no, the it, walls of the reactor are isothermal. The walls of the reactor yeah. are isothermal. No, that's why the temperature drops. But Otherwise, this, is a, this is a temperature traverse yeah. right down the middle of the bed. Yeah, but we, we, in reforming the early days, we had a lot of reactors where we actually had a lot of many beds so we could avoid this problem. In other words, we diluted, the, we had progressive the concentration gradient in there so that, because we were dealing with a reactor, which was the reactor walls were isothermal. And so you got a temperature rise or a drop, or in case of reform, you got a temperature drop. Well, you see, this is a kind of a straw man that we set up here. This is a straw man that we've set up because we want it to have this bigger hot spot as we can, you know, because the hot spot is what we want to see. Sure. So it's a little bit of a straw man in terms of it. I know what you're talking about, but this is deliberately set up to have constant wall temperature, but it's a large gradient along the axis of the reactor we can, because we are interested in how that poison wave is going to push in the spot truth that the founder of the actual reaction to the bottom of the interest as the uh no I guess we haven't but there is a beautiful example not of this uh excerpt uh fencing hydrogenation nation but uh Roman and some of his students have worked on butene to butadiene which is, which is endothermic. Man, I, I don't want to take up your time. Because man, is that beautiful. So those guys just go exactly, exactly the other way. Just beautiful. And, and they probably, as a matter of fact, have done uh, uh, more careful work in, in modeling kinetics and deactivation than, than we have for the benzene hydrogenation. 
that's an endothermic reaction. They got those endotherms in it. You obviously, they start and they move through the bed and they pull out the end of the bed. That's what they do. But I don't think that, uh, as far as I know, uh, in answer to your question, I don't know of anybody who's really done a good job in looking at a system where it is A goes to B, but B is deactivated. Now, the endothermic stuff that Fromon did, <coughs> A goes to B, and A goes to coat, and B goes to coat, and it's endothermic. But that's borrowed stuff, really great. Now, we've gone through a whole period in Shelly Cracky from the days of fixed bed, where you had a tremendous drop in temperature. So people say, well, we get away from that, we'll develop the fluid export. Large homogeneous reactor with a temperature all over the place is safe. Okay, that went on for a long time, and now we're back to subjective catalyst, and we do this in a second or two, and in a sense, the sense go through the uh, endotherm again. You know, as we come in, we hit the catalyst at high temperature with, with oil, and the temperature drops rapidly, and uh, we get a progressive flow pattern. So we almost get a pattern like you have here again. So in other words, in this technology, we bought from this bed, but we're coming with a, with a homogeneous bed, and now we're back into a, a catalytic system, which I don't understand at all, but it's just, it's just completely weird, and it's between these two. And we're faced with the same problems that we were talking about. The coping is killing the reaction while the temperature is dropping because of the endothermic reaction. So we try to overcome it by brute force by the high temperature of the catalyst hitting the oil, but in fact we, we, we hurt the situation because we, the temperature drops so rapidly. So we're, we're dealing with these problems you're talking about, and I think it's so complex to really need. It's fundamental values to help us understand this. One of the things that's interesting in these waves, and look, I know that some guys work on endothermal systems and some work on exothermal systems. So this is exothermal system, so it tends to sustain itself. See, endothermic systems will start off with an enormous endotherm. But you see, as the catalyst deactivates in an endothermic system, it shuts itself off. So the waves go away in an endothermic system. They never go away. Well, I guess I... I, 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 I